I went to go and stay in Stellenbosch for my studies. And on weekends, I would go out and get involved in, in, in partying and then was hanging around the wrong crowds mm. and started with what social use of, of, of using drugs. And it just got worse and worse and worse until eventually I was hooked on tech. Uh, I, would, uh, I ended up on the streets with a lot of people using drugs and was just out at night and in dangerous situations and uh, stealing things and lying to my parents and doing all sorts of terrible, <laughs> terrible mm -hmm. things. They laid their hands on me and prayed for me and I just started weeping and weeping. And uh, it was around that time that the Lord just revealed to me His love for me in the cross of Christ and that he had uh, taken my sin upon his shoulders, the penal substitutionary atoning work of Christ. And uh, it was really wonderful. I can, I can remember it. It was like the Lord just st stripped me from my desires for drugs and for alcohol. I knew there was a theology faculty in Stellenbosch and I, I thought the best thing I should go do is go and study theology to be equipped for the ministry to learn the Bible, to learn how the books of the Bible fit together and to learn how to preach and teach God's word to his people. And right from the get-go, I realized something is not right here. You look at the Bible and you basically read into the text uh, whatever you want. So you can look at it through a liberation lens mm -hmm. or an LGBTQ lens or a queer lens or a feminist lens. And what we got in Old Testament with Glassons was a lot of queer feminist lens, which obviously when we encountered that, we just knew something, something was not right here. Something, they, they're not respecting the text in the way this text wants to be respected. They're not, mm -hmm. they're not giving us the Bible in the way that we saw the Bible was giving itself to us yes. in 2 Timothy 3.16. Right. The Word of God yeah. Uh, yeah. Is, is inspired yeah, the yeah. still. Friends, I had the great privilege of meeting Peter and Jana Harris a couple of months ago. I, uh, we've moved to the Cape uh, almost a year ago now, and, and a couple of friends told me, you have to meet Peter and Jana Harris. They studied theology here at Stellenbosch, and they were part of a group of students who really stood up for the gospel and went through a number of very interesting things while they studied at Stellenbosch. He's now at Southern Seminary in America doing his master's degree, and he's got a call for ministry to come back to South Africa. Uh, Peter Harris, it's a great privilege uh, to meet you finally. Thank we had you. a couple of nice uh, chats uh, over Facebook Messenger, of one, of you, one of two of your other friends as well. Mm -hmm. um, let's start with um, where did you grow up? What kind of a house did you grow up in? Sure, great. Thanks for having me. It's great to be here with you. Uh, so I grew up in Durbanville. I uh, was born in Durbanville, Durbanville, raised in Durbanville, and yeah, my, my parents started going to a Baptist church when I was around six years old, I believe, so started to go to Sunday school well, from a young age and had heard about a lot of biblical worldview, foundational things such as creation and who we are as human beings from a young age. Uh, then we moved to Stellenbosch in, I think it was December 2006. I was about 10 years old and started to go to school here. And was um, we then uh, moved to Mountain View Baptist Church in Somerset West. So my family was going there. And so I thought that I was a Christian growing up. I had said the sinner's prayer. I had been baptized. And uh, when, when I got to high school, I ended up becoming quite addicted to pornography. And uh, that was something that was introduced to me uh, early on in high school and when I, when I went to uh, Somerset College, to high school. And that really just started to draw me in more and more and bring a lot of shame on my life. And just, I was, I was uh, searing my conscience more and more and choosing, choosing sin. Uh, during that time, we went to West Africa with, with my parents on a few missionary, short-term missions trips. My parents went there and did some medical 
uh, help uh, at, a, at a Baptist missionary hospital in Togo in West Africa. They're medical doctors, sure. They are, yeah, yeah. they are. And that was really an amazing experience for me as a young boy, kind of seeing what the Lord was doing there. And I really had a yearning in my heart to, to do something for the Lord, and uh, even though I wasn't saved. So, You've already prayed the prayer, but you still do not have assurance of salvation. I don't believe I was regenerate. Mm. I, mm. I uh, was dead in my sin, mm. but I... I, I never got to the point of not believing God existed, right. but I had had, mm. I had that foundation. I was told there, there was a God, but I never knew Jesus personally. Yeah. I never understood. I'd heard the gospel before, mm. but I never understood what it was yeah. about or yeah. why, why everyone was so excited mm. about it. So yeah. I saw, I believe unbelievers can see the work of God in, in a sense, you know, like Calvin says, we have that seed of religion in, inside of us, each of us. So I, I wanted, I could see what the missionaries were doing there, planting churches and evangelizing and, and, and everything. And I just thought it would be great to do something like that one day. At the time I wanted to be an engineer and go, yeah. go back there and do yeah. bowling or something like that. And then high school, last two, three mm. years of your high school, where was that? So that was at, also at Somerset College. Yeah, good reputation. So, yeah, so what yeah. happened was when I got to around grade 10, I just completely walked away from going to Student Christian Association and didn't want to go to church anymore. And just full on plunged myself into wanting to go to parties, getting drunk, mm. was exposed to mm. marijuana for the first time when mm. I was in grade 10. Yeah. Um, from there, I, 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 I got quite addicted to lifting weights mm. and that led to me becoming addicted to steroids mm. in mm. Um, grade 12 was, mm. was where I, when I really seriously started to use anabolic steroids. Mm. And that was just a cycle that was getting me deeper and deeper mm. into my sin and mm. just into worldliness and running far from God and boarding school as well Are no 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 I was with your, staying with your family mm -hmm. okay yeah what happened was uh, all of me just living in my sin and mm -hmm. when I when I, I went to first year university at Stellenbosch what did you study there? 2015 I was enrolled in a BA international studies right. I just had no purpose in mm -hmm. what I wanted to do in life I mm -hmm. um it was just so living for myself and the pleasures of this world mm. and didn't even care what, what I studied. Mm. I just wanted to go and study something. Yeah. I knew I had to go and study. So, And on weekends, I would go out and get involved in, in, in partying and then was hanging around the wrong crowds mm. and started with what social use of, of, of using drugs. And it just got worse and worse and worse until eventually I was hooked on tech in halfway through 2015. So that was, that was bad, mm -hmm. uh, that, that caused kind of my living, uh, this lifestyle to go downhill very quickly. Mm -hmm. It's a very What, what does tech do drug. if you take it over an extended period of time? Not, well, you don't even have to take it over an extended period of time. It very quickly, mm -hmm. very quickly causes you to be extremely... Um, uninhibited and so you start lying you start stealing mm. it gives you such a euphoric feeling for such a short period of time uh, you get and then you become so down that you you become more and more addicted to it and it's such a harsh substance mm. that uh, you kind of sear your conscience very much so you you, you do things you would have never dreamed of doing mm. so uh, I would. Uh, I ended up on the streets with a lot of people using drugs, and was just out at night and in dangerous situations, and uh, stealing things and lying to my parents and doing all sorts of terrible, <laughs> terrible mm -hmm. things. But the Lord protected me in all of that time. I was never injured, never harmed, mm -hmm. overdosed a few times, but came. The Lord yeah. uh, allowed me to live. And, yeah. and, and sustained me. And uh, I remember there were times when my heart would, uh, it felt like my heart would, would give in at a stage, but the Lord was so gracious right. and even just protecting me in the places that I went and, mm. and from a lot of things that I just think 
You know, Paul says in Romans, I believe it's in Romans 9, he says, um, if it wasn't for the grace of God in keeping the remnant, mm. we would have become like Sodom and like Gomorrah. Yeah. And I just yeah. think of, if it wasn't in, for God's mm. grace in restraining me in, in, some, in, in that path where yeah. I was walking away from him, how yeah. far I could have yeah. gone. Yeah. How did but, things fall <clears throat> apart then at that stage? <clears throat> uh, my, my parents drug tested me. They found drugs in my system. They, uh, they realized just how far I, w I was going. Uh, a, lot of, uh, a lot of my friends saw how far I was going, but told my parents about it. And um, I continued to just not listen to anyone's advice and just push further and further to the, to the extent where I booked myself into a short-term rehab to kind of try and get everyone off of my back. That was Crescent Clinic in, in, in Cape Town. And mm. the counselors there had chosen is, uh, the Islamic faith as their, as their, uh, um, as their recovery religion. Mm. And so it was just really bad for me. And I came out a lot more angry than I went in. And so it got even, when I came out of that short-term rehab, I believe that was August 2015, went back onto the streets and was drinking and then marijuana and then back onto uh, okay. tech again. And so what happened was December 1st, 2015, my parents called the, the police to come mm -hmm. and take me from my home to the court to, to get a court order against me. Your parents? My parents, yeah. Okay, wow. My parents got a court order against me to, to bring me to the court in Stellenbosch where uh, the court can send someone who's a drug addict to, to rehab for a certain amount of time to get against their will, which mm. is really, mm. was just a bit of tough love on their side. Were you upset and, and about I that? I was very upset okay. and angry at the time. Yeah. Now you said before uh, you went there, there were Christians who came to pray with you. Just talk to us about that a bit. Well, what happened was the Christians were actually at the court okay. when I arrived there. They took me, I was still trying to fight everything and mm. trying, to, trying to convince myself and other people that I wasn't, I didn't have a problem. What happened was they, they took me from the court to their halfway house in Durbanville and the halfway house is just somewhere where they, someone who's coming out of rehab can come and stay in the halfway house to tr transition into society again. Mm. Or someone who's on their way to rehab, uh, they take them into their halfway house, care for them for a little bit and then drive them to the rehab. So uh, what happened was uh, there were Christian men and the halfway house was called Uniting Christians Against Narcotics. And I only actually found this out a couple of years later, but that's, that's what its name was. And one evening they had a, a small group and they told me I need to come, it's compulsory. And this was probably around 4th, 5th of December, so a few days after. And they sat me down on a table in the middle of the small group and they had invited a pastor and another guy, or a couple of guys, I can't completely remember, but they had invited someone to come and pray for me. And they asked me if they could pray for me and the Lord just started to soften my heart and I, I said yes. And um, they laid their hands on me and prayed for me and I just started weeping and weeping. And uh, it was, around that time that the Lord just revealed to me his love for me in the cross of Christ and that he had uh, taken my sin upon his shoulders and I experienced for the first time um, the gospel and I had heard it many times but it was in that moment that they prayed for me and prayed for deliverance and prayed for the Holy Spirit to come and soften my heart, give me a heart of, of flesh that the Lord opened my eyes to the penal substitutionary atoning work of Christ. And uh, it was really wonderful. I can, I can remember it. It was like the Lord just st stripped me from my desires for drugs and for alcohol. And of course, uh, we know how sanctification works. We continue to struggle with our sin, our indwelling sin. But by His grace, I have not gone back to that lifestyle since wow. then. Wow. So that's re remarkable. Yeah. And then you went. Mm -hmm. You were at rehab for about seven, six, seven months. Yeah. So after that, I was fighting, 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 and then the Lord softened my heart mm -hmm. and convicted me of my sin. Right. 
and uh, I saw that I had a, a need for mm. for Christ and okay. for His His work. Uh, and I phoned my parents and mm. I told them I want to go to rehab, and they were they were shocked. They were just absolutely yeah. shocked, and so they they were like. What's going on? And they got together right. with me, and they mm. they they wanted me to give them my word that I was mm. going to stay a certain amount of time. And I was like, "Yeah, I'll, I'll go." And mm. uh, I went, and it it was a really great, a great time. I started reading my Bible in rehab. Went to uh, there was a local church, non-denominational church there mm. that took us to to church every Sunday mm. in a bus, and we heard the gospel, and we heard we heard um, yeah. we heard. Sermons. It wasn't the the it wasn't expository preaching. It was mm-hmm. topical, but yeah. it was it was good for my my beginning journey with Christ. Can you remember which book of the Bible you delved into? I delved into Romans mm-hmm. <laughs> and the Gospel of John. I remember. Talk talk to us about that. Uh, yeah. Here you come. You've been a drug addict. Uh-huh. You've been through so many things. You just for the first time mm-hmm. understood. Christ's substitutionary atonement for mm-hmm. you, a guilty sinner. And mm-hmm. here you come and read Romans and mm-hmm. John's Gospel. What did that do uh, to you at that stage? Romans was amazing for me because uh, it showed me that I, everyone has fallen short of God's glory and that I'm a miserable sinner. That is, yeah, Romans 3, 23. Romans 3, 23, that I have fallen short of his glory in every area of my life yeah. and never obeyed the law perfectly. Mm-hmm. And, but, but God put Christ forth as, as the atoning sacrifice for my sin in my place, Romans, Romans 5. And while I was, Romans 5 was amazing for me because while I was still a sinner, yeah. while I was still using drugs and running far from Christ, he died for me and uh, just, just the, his grace was so uh, present in, in, in that, uh, as I was reading through that. Um, while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. Yeah. There's nothing in us that caused him to do that, but his, yeah. his free grace and mm-hmm. love. Mm-hmm. So then the Gospel of John was amazing for me in the sense that it really opened my eyes to God's electing grace. And so when I got to John, where, where Jesus speaks about the fact that you did not choose me, but I chose you, and that you would go and bear much fruit. So let me just interject. There are lots of people who struggle with election, mm-hmm. uh, but you, with your history, your background, mm-hmm. do you want to explain just to people who struggle to understand that why it is so powerful, mm-hmm. why it is so significant that mm-hmm. God elects us through His grace. Yeah. Well, firstly, I want to acknowledge that um, we do struggle with these doctrines, and just because we struggle, it doesn't, it doesn't mean that uh, uh, we're abnormal. I think that Satan can cause us to doubt God's electing grace, our own inability to grasp just how free and amazing God's electing grace is can cause us to, to, to wonder. But for me, when I, when I first encountered it in the Bible, it was so obvious and so amazing, and I was just like, this is, this is great. But uh, it is important to understand because God, we, t- we tend to think that we, we, live, in a, we live in a give and take relationship exactly. with God. Yeah where, okay, we were saved, we're justified by His grace, and we need to continue trying to earn His favor. And uh, His love is eternal. Before the foundation yeah. of the world, yeah. He chose us. And I, 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 I struggle with that sometimes. I, 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 I uh, was so amazed at it, and sometimes I do wonder, um, wonder, about his love because it is just so, just so amazing. And then I, I have to come back to the Bible. I have to ask Jesus to make me in awe of his grace again. Mm. Uh, and so, but we need, to, we need to press into his word. We need to press into these doctrines and ask him to change our affections 
uh, to, to understand them more and more because when we, when we live in that place of knowing his electing grace and the fact that he's predestined us and chosen us before the foundation of the world. Ephesians. Ephesians 1, yeah. uh, we, we can have such assurance and from that assurance yeah. flows godliness and holiness yeah. and a righteous life yes. that just bears so much fruit. Yeah. And uh, we, we, we want to strive for that assurance and mm. part of having that assurance is resting in his electing grace. Yes. Yeah. yes. So, so let's move from there. Then you, you got a call for ministry. Uh, uh, God has done this remarkable work in your life. Uh, you've got a r- remarkable background. Uh, you've got you know, all the stuff that you went through, the drugs, <coughs> the police, the rehab, um, the knowing the atoning grace of, of the Lord Jesus Christ. And you, then you get a call for ministry. And then you end up at Stellenbosch at the theological faculty. Mm-hmm. <laughs> um, take us through a couple of the significant experiences you had studying theology uh, to become a minister at the theological fac- faculty in Stellenbosch. Sure. Well, I thought, I, f- I felt the subject of call to ministry. I believe in the, the internal and external call of, yeah. of a minister. I think it's helpful to understand the call mm. of, of someone going to the ministry in those terms. So I felt a strong internal call to want to preach the gospel and counsel and be in ministry. I think it was my last month in rehab. And mm. so mm. I knew there was a theology faculty in Stellenbosch and I, I thought the best thing I should go do is go and study theology to be equipped for the ministry, to learn the Bible, to learn how the books of the Bible fit together and to learn how to preach and teach God's word to his people. So I applied to study theology. I got in and started studying 2017, January, February, February 2017. Mm. And right from the get-go, I realized something is not right here. Something is something Ex- is off. Explain that for normal people. Uh, so the first class we had was theology, it was Old and New Testament. It was combined with a professor called Julie Clausens. Mm. And I went in completely just I'd gone through that experience of meeting Christ, of reading his word, of seeing these great truths of the inspiration of the scriptures, 2, 2 Timothy 3, 2 Peter 1, of seeing um, Christ's majesty and his supremacy, of seeing the necessity of regeneration, John 3, of wanting to understand more, more deeply about these doctrines. Mm-hmm. Uh, and what, did, what, did, what were you taught in that module? We were met with a host of, we were, we were met with a methodology of reading the scriptures called historical criticism, where, where they look at the context of the scripture, in, where they try to look at scripture in its context, but what they do is they, they, they make a, such a large gap between scripture in its context and how then we understand scripture today. So, for example, they could say, well, Timothy, Paul says to Timothy in 1 Timothy 2 that women can't be preachers or teachers uh, and exercise authority over a man because of certain uh, factors within that context. And so the better we can understand uh, those those factors and how, uh, how that was a culturally bound command, then we can basically look at how we should apply it today, that we can have mm. female pastors because we no longer live under those circumstances. That's one example of historical criticism. Another example is they just completely said none of the authors that wrote the books actually wrote the books. So for example, Isaiah was split into first Isaiah and second Isaiah because they say the first part of Isaiah is all about judgment, the coming of judgment and sin and all the different nations falling. And then all of a sudden there's Isaiah 40 to 66 about uh, God's coming salvation. So Mm. it it almost seems as if the themes have changed. So it must be two separate authors. Mm. One was written beforehand, the other one was written after they were put together. That's an example. Another example of historical criticism that we met with was 
uh, they, in order to take away the veracity of prophecy and fulfillment in the Old Testament, they say that a lot of the Old Testament books were written post-exile, post, post, uh, post, post the Babylonian exile. exile. So they can then take away a lot of those prophecies because they can say they only wrote, wrote those books about the fall of Babylon in hindsight. Yeah, that's what they say. Uh, and then finally, I think uh, one of the most damaging views of historical criticism is that they say that separate books of the Bible can have different messages to, to different each Different theologies. Different and theologies. It's, it's, it's diverse and it's almost, mm -hmm. uh, you know, contradictory mm -hmm. as well. Yeah. So they say, for example, if we take it in the New, if we take an example of the New Testament, they say mm -hmm. the message of Paul as opposed to the message of Jesus. Yeah. Jesus was a gospel, was, was a message of love. Paul yeah. was a little bit influenced by mm. masochism and he was, you know, he was against women or he was, uh, he was more restrictive. Uh, mm. uh, so they do that with many different th yeah. theologians. Instead of seeing that it's a unified message, mm. it's one beautiful diamond from right. different perspectives. Yeah. It's now shredded and ripped apart. There's the authors aren't who they say they were. When Paul writes, I, Paul, an apostle, write this with my own hand, it was, they said, it was someone else who wrote that in Paul's name. And so now we have basically a Bible that's lying to us. Mm. But then they call that uh, pseudo epigraphic yeah. um, mm. letters. So the historical criticism is just, there's many different aspects to it, but it's a, it's a, it's a very damaging way of, of, of viewing the Bible where you just rip rip the Bible to shreds mm. and that paves the way to, to then read it with a reader response. Um, reader response criticism is then the next step where you, you look at the Bible and you basically read into the text uh, whatever you want. So you can look at it through a liberation lens mm. or an LGBTQ lens or a queer lens or a feminist lens and what we got in Old Testament with Glassons was a lot of queer feminist lens, which obviously we just, mm. we just, uh, yeah. we were, we were, when we encountered that, we just knew something, something was not right here. Something, they, they're not respecting the text in the way this text wants to be respected. They're okay. not, mm. they're not giving us the Bible in the way that we saw the Bible was giving itself to us yes. in 2 Timothy 3.16, right. the word of God. Yeah. Uh, yeah. is, is inspired yeah, yeah. Theopino still so yeah. breathe out. So. Uh, talk to us about, you had a module where you did a, a, a paper on abortion. Mm -hmm. um, do you want to talk about what happened with your paper on abortion? Sure, so it was, it was actually my final exam for, for, for public theology and uh, I, I tried to really give the argument for pro-life and I tried to give the argument for pro-abortion and I gave, I, I really put my, my all into, into, this, into this paper and I, I, was, I was also a little bit testing just to see what, what would come of it. So I um, tried, to, tried to argue well for, for both sides and then give a conclusion as to why abortion is a heinous sin in the eyes of God, and why, um, why, why we are we are human beings from the time of conception, mm. and I received a, a bad mark mm. mark for that. So mm. that just showed me the uh, the state of the public theology. It was it was actually on ethics. So mm. we did euthanasia, abortion, mm. and it was it was very sad to see mm. that they were. They were essentially mm. marking me down because I was arguing pro-life in, mm. in my conclusion. So, so I've got an um, a interview with one of the professors there um, in Stellenbosch, and it relates to historical criticism mm -hmm. uh, uh, and how people would dissect the text and they would, uh, I mean, we had the same at Pretoria where they would say there's this huge gulf between us and that context, and then they would renounce the supernatural and they would uh, try to break up the text in little units and make a reconstruction uh, and then basically all the historical stuff basically can't you know can't make it through that whole 
net or sif that mm -hmm. they impose on the tax. So, so one of the professors from Stellenbosch, they had an interview with him. Um, I think he taught you some, some lectures. And they had an interview with him about the resurrection a couple of years ago. And uh, I'm going to read it in Afrikaans, and then I want you just to respond to what do you think the implications of this is for us. So they asked him, um, is it important for you that Jesus really rose from the dead? And then he responded like this in Afrikaans. Dit is van centrale belang vir my geloof, maar dan moet van die begin af bijgevoegd word dat het nie om historische belang gaan nie, maar om geestelike en theologische belang. Um, what, what comes to mind when you hear a statement like that from, hmm. a, from a theology professor? Uh, hmm. saying that the resurrection is not about hmm. whether it's historical, it's a spiritual and a theological uh, truth. What comes to my mind is when Paul said to the Corinthians, if Christ is not raised from the dead, you are dead in your sins, your faith is in vain. And so the whole hope of the Bible is that we will one day be raised from the dead not in spiritual bodies, but in physical bodies that we have, we have received now as, as a stewardship from God that will die because of our sin, but that glory of glories will be raised again. And if Christ wasn't physically raised from the dead, neither can we be physically raised mm -hmm. from the dead. The Bible calls Christ the first fruits. The Bible calls, calls Christ the firstborn from mm -hmm. the dead. Uh, prototokos, a term used to describe Christ's uh, uh, preeminence and majesty and, and sonship and glory over all things. Mm -hmm. And so, I mean, it's just an absolutely, it, it's a ridiculous statement. It's, it's, separate, it's, it's a Gnostic statement separating. You yep. can't separate the physical yeah. reality from the spiritual yes. reality of what sure. happened in, yeah. in the resurrection. Yeah. Uh, Jesus makes us spiritually alive, mm. but it's in vain if we're not also made physically alive one day, in, mm. in which, which Christ calls the regeneration of all things, the, yeah. the coming of the new heavens and the new earth. Mm. And uh, so a lot is going on in my mind, but Wonderful. that's... So, so yeah. let's just wrap up your Stellenbosch here. So, so um, it was a struggle for you. Mm -hmm. uh, coming to the Lord Jesus Christ, and there you came, you did not experience the, the teaching to, to actually build your faith, mm -hmm. to equip you mm -hmm. to become a pastor. So, so uh, that's a tragedy. If we think back of the, the, the history of Stellenbosch, it was opened by men who wanted to move away from liberal theology that came from Utrecht and mm -hmm. Leiden. Uh, and they started, they founded Stellenbosch for that purpose. But that's a trend all, all over the world, unfortunately, mm -hmm. where uh, theological faculty become theologically progressive liberal over time. Now, so after your theology degree at Stellenbosch, the Lord opened doors for you to go and, and do a master's degree for ministry under people like Professor Tom Schreiner at Southern Seminary. Mm -hmm. And um, I've got some of his work and... One of the things that I really appreciate about theological seminaries that are still reformed, that is still confessional, is they do historical research, they do context, um, but they do it all under the authority of the inspiration of the Word of God. Mm -hmm. And they are also able to see the big picture. And, and Thomas Schreiner has done a lovely theology of the New Testament, the Old Testament. We were not allowed to do that when we studied as well. Mm -hmm. They want to break up everything. Mm -hmm. And a biblical theology helps you to get the big picture of everything, how mm -hmm. everything fits together. Um, do you want to um, talk to us about your experience under someone like uh, Professor Tom Schreiner, who's an elder in a church I think that you've also... Been to. What is it mm -hmm. like to study under a scholar who's published, I mean, mm -hmm. so many volumes, uh, rigorous academic research, mm -hmm. but so committed to the authority of Scripture? What, what, what's been the different experience for you compared to Stellenbosch to Southern Seminary? Wow. 
There are so many things, but... Go for it. Uh, studying under someone like that or someone even like a Stephen Wellham who's mm. a little bit more on the sy systematic side is yeah. they all just they they sit under the authority of scripture and they are very humble about it and they they know that they are serving a God who is sovereign who is holy who is righteous and who has spoken truth spoken truthfully in his word and so just to see like the carefulness of how they go through the text uh, when they reach a difficult text uh, they try and interpret it with using other texts to shine light on those difficult texts and they're also willing to actually say they don't completely know what what this text is saying but uh, but but they're also, they can also say, well, I think this, in my opinion, is the correct interpretation. And so they're really gracious with other people who disagree with them. However, they, they also stand strongly on, the fa on their convictions. Tom Schreiner is a five-point Calvinist, but mm -hmm. in class he will, we, we were going through, is it First Timothy the other day, where, where, where it says that God desires all people to be saved, or in First John that he's the propitiation for the whole world. And so... He's really careful about trying to explain how that fits into a definite atonement and Christ's atoning work. But he's also able to say, uh, Bruce Ware is one of my great friends and he's a four point mm -hmm. Calvinist and uh, to, be, to be gracious like that, but, but not to be um, accommodating then to, to, to liberal mm -hmm. theology, but to other Christians who have disagreements. That's been helpful to uh, to see that um, also just it's all about Christ for them uh, from the Old Testament to the New Testament it's all about the doctrines of grace it's all about uh, Christ's atoning work and uh, the Father the Son and the Spirit and how, how they, they come and transform us from the inside out to, to live holy and righteous mm. lives and um, yeah so they, they, they take every verse in the Bible as God speaking, as the Word of God, and that that is just completely different to, to what I've experienced at the mm. theology faculty at Stellenbosch, and yeah, so that's, that's a lot of what, what, what I've experienced, but the, and, and, and something that's also stood out for me, you know, is we can read the Bible and believe what it says but it's also amazing to 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 receive good teaching from men whose lives are in accordance with what the bible speaks about so someone like a like a tom schreiner he's he you know he can speak about uh boltman and he can speak about all these german theologians and he he's can, read their works he's he's read their works they're not afraid he, of in, in, he engaging is, historical yeah. criticism but they also uh, so, so he'll mention in class why he'll mention this is what the feminists say this is what Boltman says this is what and then he'll say this is what the text says <laughs> this, uh, and, and and then he'll give he'll give his his interpretation and his life it aligns with the scripture they're all either elders or teaching or ministering in the local church building up the local church mm -hmm. um, living for the supremacy of Christ and you you can see that in their lives and uh, so you know they they're they're able to engage with mm. with with uh, what's going on in the, in the theological world but they really they really just want to give us Bible give us um, what God's word is saying uh, interpreted well interpreted carefully and uh, from from a confessional reformed mm. perspective yeah and in a way that that's building us up and edifying us for the ministry and yeah. they're not trying to show off how clever they are or give us mm. fancy words and i mean we learn we learn the fancy words but <laughs> they want to they want to help us proclaim the supremacy mm. the glory and the greatness yeah. of jesus christ and so yeah. that's what i went there for and that's what i've experienced and mm. i'm so grateful to the lord for mm. that so 
And you're on your way back once you've finished, and mm -hmm. then the Lord is calling you for ministry in the Cape. Yes. So okay. we, 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 we were just appointed with an organization called Reaching and Teaching. Mm. If you, you want to look at it online, it's yeah. rtim.org. Yeah. Yeah. And they are an organization that really want to support people uh, to build up healthy local churches okay. uh, throughout the world. All so right. Whether that's through yeah. church planting, pastoring, biblical yes. counseling, or yeah. um, theological training. Yeah. So we're excited to see more healthy churches yes. flourish and grow, proclaiming the doctrines of grace and the sovereignty of God and His mercy throughout South Africa. Praise the Lord. Peter, mm -hmm. uh, thank you for the privilege. Can, can I ask you to do a short prayer for sure. other men who are battling at colleges mm -hmm. at the moment and uh, do a prayer for them, uh, for the Lord's protection and uh, guiding them through a difficult phase? I will do. Let's thank pray. <clears throat> Father, we thank you, Lord, that you are our strong rock and our fortress, that from everlasting to everlasting, you are God. Lord, we are weak and feeble, and you are strong and righteous and holy, and you have shown your righteousness through the death of your son Jesus on the cross, where he bore all of our sin, Lord. And we pray, Lord, for uh, ministers, for pastors, for students throughout South Africa, that you would strengthen them, that you would be with them, that you would use their struggles and the difficulties, Lord, to help them to press into your word. And that in this time that they would see that as they press into your word, your words are true, your words are spirit and life, Lord, as you have said, and that your words will never put us to shame. Lord, where else shall we go? You have the words of eternal life. So we pray, Lord, that uh, if, there was, if there is anyone struggling, Lord, if there is anyone um, struggling with doubts and oppression and persecution, Lord, we pray that you would bless them, that you would help them, that you would um, help them to know, Lord, that you are with them and that your spirit would uh, help them to understand, Lord, that you will begin a good work in those whom you have begun it. We pray all of this, Lord, in Jesus' name. Amen.